Yes, it has sugar in it, but no one is telling you to have it all the time. Treat it like a supplement. Don't treat it like your sole source of carbohydrates. I'm talking about honey. Now there's a reason that tribes all over the world and why so many people in history have touted honey as being something powerful. It's not woo woo, witch doctor, weird stuff. It's legit and there's actually science and there's large trials to back this stuff up. Seven reasons why honey is legit. Number one, it's a heck of a lot better than refined sugar. And this is not just me saying it, there's actual literature. The Journal of Medicinal Foods had published a paper. It was pretty wild. They took a look at honey compared to varying ratios of sucrose and dextrose over different periods of time, both acutely all the way ranging to like 15 days after consumption, what it would do to the body. They found that most importantly, honey ended up having a significantly lower plasma glucose response than any other sweetener. So even though it has a decent amount of sugar in it, somehow it wasn't spiking glucose nearly as high, especially in those that were diabetic or insulin resistant. This is what's wild. It possibly has to do with the chemical composition of honey in the first place. Just the way it's molecularly structured, it might break down a little bit different. Additionally, it's also high in fructose compared to a lot of other sweeteners. It's about 45% fructose. And don't get me wrong, we have to be real with fructose. Like fructose can certainly contribute to a fatty liver. Fructose can certainly be metabolically problematic. But we're not talking about eating gallons of honey here. We're talking about a tablespoon or two. And in this particular case, uses a sweetener, the fructose doesn't put stress on like a demand for insulin. So you're gonna have a little bit less of that issue, especially if you're insulin resistant. Number two is its effect on lipids. And the Saudi Medical Journal had published a meta-analysis looking at seven different trials. And the consensus of these trials was that consuming honey increased HDL, decreased LDL, decreased triglycerides, and most importantly, decreased oxidized LDL. Oxidized LDL is the real, real problem. Most of the mechanistic and molecular research points to something that are called niacin-like substances. These are compounds in honey, various compounds, that have effects on apoloprotein B, because niacin impacts apoloprotein B. Apoloprotein B is what forces or allows VLDL, very low density lipoproteins, to essentially aggregate. This is when LDL becomes a problem, when it's in a very low density form and it aggregates and it's very hard for the body to, in very simple essence, break it down. So although more literature needs to come out to understand the true mechanisms, we can see in the larger scale clinical data, the trials, that something is happening here when subjects consume honey. Number three is the antioxidant effect. There was a study published in Oxidative Medicine and Longevity. This is really interesting. I'm gonna read you an excerpt from this particular study. Sugars, proteins, amino acids, carotenes, organic acids, Maillard reaction products, production of reactive oxygen species all contribute to the antioxidant effect of honey. So essentially there's all these different compounds in honey that seem to have antioxidant effects. But one of the most powerful effects is that it seems to drive up the antioxidant capabilities of our own body's antioxidants. So yeah, you're adding external antioxidants, but you're also increasing the potency of your body's internal antioxidants, which to be totally fair, are probably more important. They're more powerful and they know our bodies inside and out compared to an external antioxidant. There's a study that's published in the journal Xenobiotics, took a look at 80 people had them consume honey for a period of six months. And they took their blood before they started taking honey at one month and then again at the end. They found that their level of reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress went down significantly over that six month period when they were consuming honey. But here's what's wild. As soon as they stopped consuming honey, the oxidative stress went back up. So there's something going on there. Again. We can't put our finger on everything. We don't know everything there is to know about honey, but there's something going on that's pretty powerful there. Now, FYI, I put a link down below for Thrive Market. That's a 30% off discount link. I mentioned them because I think it's relevant because they've got a wide variety of different honeys that you can choose from. Now, 
I am not sponsored by a honey company. I have had Thrive Market as a sponsor on this channel for over half of a decade, and they just so happen to have a lot of brands of honey, and I think it makes sense to mention it with this video. So you can take a look at all the different kinds that they have. They have flavored kinds, whatever, you name it. So if you wanna start adding it to your coffee, or do it like I do it. I treat it like a supplement. If I feel like a little cold coming on or something like that, I will take a spoonful of it. If I wanna have a little bit of a different antioxidant effect after a workout, I might mix it into some yogurt or a protein shake. Anyhow, that link down below saves you 30% off whatever you wanna get from Thrive Market, whether it's honey or not, whatever groceries you want, and a free $60 gift. So use that link in the top line of the description and stock up your groceries. Number four is its powerful impact on metabolic health by driving up what is called adiponectin. Now, adiponectin is something that increases the utilization of glucose, improves glucose metabolism, but also increases fatty acid oxidation in the muscles. So what's interesting is if you look at the rodent model research, granted it's been seen in human data too, but there's interesting rodent model research that paints it very clearly. This particular study was published in the journal Pharmacy and Pharmacology, and it did take a look at rodents, and it found that when they were given honey, they had increases in their serum adiponectin levels, but they also had decreases in their glucose levels and increases in fatty acid oxidation. Now, it would make sense that the increases in adiponectin would drive up fat utilization, okay, fat burning, fat oxidation, and consequently drive down glucose levels. But then when we look at a study that was published in Nutrients, we also see that when you have increases in adiponectin, as well as consuming honey, you have decreases in systemic inflammation and increases in insulin sensitivity. So consuming honey, even though it's a sugar, seems to improve insulin sensitivity by way of potentially modulating inflammation. Inflammation sort of acts as almost like this static that could impede the action of insulin, therefore making you more insulin resistant. If you can clear the inflammation, which it seems as though honey has an impact on, you actually improve insulin sensitivity. So we can't put the cart before the horse all the time and say, hey, just because it's sugar, it's gonna be bad. Honey is very unique in the fact that it might actually, even though it's sugar, it gives you like a almost one step back, two steps forward, if you wanna put it like that. Now we get into the interesting stuff with wound healing. There was a large scale meta-analysis pulled out of the Cochrane Library that took a look at 26 different trials, particularly on like wound healing. First and foremost, they found that honey would increase post-operative wound healing significantly faster than even antiseptic like uh, washes. So after an operation, they would get better healing effect by using the honey. And there was even, quote, high quality evidence that it would heal partial thickness burns significantly faster. Now, when we see high quality evidence out of a large scale meta analysis, that's pretty promising stuff. Okay, now from the wound healing side, there's a couple different ways this could be working. For one, honey is sticky. Okay, so you're getting some moisture retention there. That could certainly help but you're also getting a potential antimicrobial effect there. There's an antibacterial effect, antimicrobial effect that clearly has some potency since the literature is suggesting it's more powerful than an antiseptic rinse. What exactly is going on there and what particular bacteria and antimicrobial effects, we don't really know. Again, that's kind of the interesting thing about honey. We don't know everything. We just know that it's doing something cool. But when you look at some of the stuff we do know about honey, for instance, it increases hydrogen peroxide production. So its ability to do that, if you've ever put hydrogen peroxide on a wound before, you know it gets all foamy and kind of weird, right? If you put honey on a wound, you would see the same kind of thing. So you're almost getting like a sustained effect with this hydrogen peroxide that the body can produce and kind of it creates in some ways out of thin air. The next one is some newer literature that came out of the Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience in 2023. And this is talking about the effect on the brain. Now, this is very preliminary data, so we can't take it to the bank, but I wanted to include it in this video because it's promising. What we're finding is that honey's ability to drive down oxidative stress in the brain is so powerful that it might actually inhibit what are called apoptopic signals in neurons. So it may stop neurons from prematurely dying. So what this means for you is as we get older, and our brain cells begin to naturally die because as we get older, the rate at which they die is much faster. A lot of it has to do with the oxidative stress in our brain. Not to mention we've established that honey has anti-inflammatory properties. 
So when we reduce neuroinflammation, we improve the actual signaling and the ability for fuel to be properly used in the brain. If there's less inflammation, then glucose signaling can be better, insulin signaling and receiving can be better. So you're getting better overall energetics in the brain, but you're also getting less oxidative stress and less damage in the brain. And lastly, a huge one, respiratory tract infections. So there was a study published in the BMJ, took a look at 14 different studies, and it found that when it came down to respiratory tract infections, honey not only improved the symptom score, like the severity of symptoms, but also decreased the severity of the cough and the frequency of a cough. Now, why is this the case? Again, there's two kind of theories here. One is the more mechanical theory, and that's the fact that honey is thick and viscous and maybe it's stopping the coughing from happening. That's certainly a realistic thing, but doesn't explain the severity of the symptoms overall. And there's other studies that demonstrate actually shortening of the life of a cold too. So perhaps that has more to do with the antimicrobial, antibacterial effects, but also the reduction in inflammation that we've seen across other studies. Maybe just reducing that inflammation is allowing for a better feeling and reduction of severity. Anyhow, as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.